Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on modernizing your UI with the 7 ULP. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, today, if you would like to participate, you should have a panel on your right hand side of your screen that you can open and close. On there, you can submit questions throughout the webinar and join in the conversation in the chat. Um, you are welcome to also follow us and join us on Twitter with the hashtags embedded GUI, crank storyboard and 7ULP. We will be addressing the uh, questions that are submitted at the end of this presentation, so please do pop them into the questions box on the right hand side. Okay, today's speakers, we have Brian Edmund, uh, President and Co-Founder of Crank Software. With over 20 years of embedded systems experience focused on embedded graphics, Brian actually created Crank Software and the story, our storyboard product here that we're going to be talking about today. Prior to Crank, he did lead the graphic development group at QNX Software, and he is an Ironman mountain biking, biking and cycling enthusiast. We also have Nick Jitoreski here, the i.mx product manager of NXP, uh, with also with 20 plus years experience in embedded software applications, device drivers, flash memory, and all things else you can see there on your screen. Nick is going to be speaking about the i.mx uh, family here and the 7ULP today. Okay, so here is our agenda for you. We're going to be looking into the 7 ULP. I'm discussing all the power and performance capabilities of this new product. We're going to be talking to you about the uh, rich 2D and 3D graphic capability and introducing you to hybrid rendering, a unique functionality of Crank Storyboard today. We're going to be wrapping up looking at some power analysis and comparisons uh, whilst using the hybrid rendering strategies and we'll be following up with a Q&A at the end. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Nick to present. Nick, over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, thank, hello, everybody. I uh, just wanted to uh, show you what our latest item X7 ULP offering is. And uh, just let me take some time to share. Uh, Alicia, I, I believe that we I am sharing at this point. So. Again, uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, join you to talk about the 7ULP and how uh, we work well with Crank together and, uh, and how our GPUs help uh, the ultra low power uh, applications uh, succeed and greater battery life and uh, as well as uh, uh, lower uh, power consumption. So in the past, many of you have uh, seen the iDynamics 6 product line we had a very very scalable family, uh, all the way from a quad core plus down to a single core 6 ULL. And uh, going forward, as roadmaps go, everything goes uh, onward, upward, to the right. Uh, we felt like there was an opportunity for uh, an existing set of applications that really weren't covered by the 8, 8M and 8X. And those are targeted at uh, power efficient designs. So uh, in the past, we've released the iDynamx 7, which is our first flexible, efficient connectivity type of a platform. And now we're kind of re-architecting uh, the, uh, the ultra-low power idea with the iDynamx 7 ULP, ultra-low power. So here we see uh, one key aspects of that is heterogeneous processing. Uh, so what is heterogeneous processing? Uh, it's really an ability to offload tasks, have a big core and a small core. Uh, anytime you have processes that are really uh, not needing to be run on the large core, you can offload them to the smaller core. And at the same time, if you don't need to run anything on the big core, you can optimize power by shutting down as much silicon as possible. And that does include the larger Cortex-A core. Also, it gives you an ability to create a firewall to increase security. You can lock certain peripherals to the core and then allow uh, either sharing or uh, not sharing the peripherals. So if something goes, ha if something happens on one core, uh, you can be, uh, uh, re you can rest assured that really the other core is going to be uh, uh, running smoothly. And we also look at the GPU. The GPU is really a form of heterogeneous processing. Anytime you offload processing from the CPU and onto the GPU, that's really considered heterogeneous processing. Here we see our new normal. And what is our new normal? crossover processing. 
you're going to see a lot of customers come up from the MCU world, and you're going to see a lot of customers come down from the application processor world. With the IDENMX 7 ULP, since we do have the heterogeneous processing, you're going to see a lot of applications uh, being created in that space. So that's a, a nice thing for the MCU world is it, it's going to give them an ability to have graphics, rich graphics like you see on your cell phones. At the same time, it's going to allow the application processor designs to really come down into low power type of applications. And we talk about low power. How do we achieve low power with the item X7 ULP? Well, we achieve it through several ways. First and foremost is we pick the right process technology. We picked fully depleted silicon on insulator, 28 nanometer process. Next, we designed the heterogeneous architecture in a manner that maximizes power efficiency. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and to, uh, since you have the hardware, you have to really enable everything through hardware and through software. So we make sure to optimize each power mode. And last but not least, we make sure to give you the right IP, the right connectivity, whether you need performance on the performance side or whether you can uh, uh, scale back and really concentrate on low power IP selection. So how, do, how are we doing with uh, low power? Uh, looking back with the 6 Solo Lite, which was one of our first low power processors, uh, looking back where we were and we, where we are now, you can see a, a, a great improvement on standby power. So you saw with the 7 Solo, our first processor talking about power efficiency, and now with the 7 ULP, we're actually seeing 5% of the standby power that we saw with the 6 Solo Lite. So that's a, that's a great improvement. Same with the runtime power. So as you see, both in standby power and runtime power, really the direction is there, heading downward. Why is that important? Well, both modes are very important. For instance, if you actually take a uh, use case, such as a medical wearable, uh, where we, you have a lot of user interaction, you're going to see the Cortex-A7 running and the Cortex-M4 running. So that's one mode. Next mode you're going to see is where you don't interact with the UI, but you still have a UI showing up on the screen. A lot of times the A7 is gated at that point and the M4 is running. And last but not least, you have a, you have a lot of modes where you go into deep sleep, where you, uh, you still need to have a quick wake up time, an ability to uh, uh, start measuring uh, data, sensors, et cetera. And so you have this uh, duty cycle. And a lot of times uh, for low power applications, the duty cycle is, is really low, uh, five to 10%, but it's really important to optimize not only just the user interaction, but the deep sleep mode, but you also have to concentrate on optimizing the sensor mode where the A7 and the M4 are in various types of uh, uh, situations. So to really summarize, we have rich 3D graphics, 2D graphics, and that's really important. Not only do we have a 3D GPU that takes care of the 2D graphics, but we also added a separate 2D GPU. And that's one thing that we want to talk to you about today. And uh, Brian's going to show you a couple of uh, different uh, uh, use cases and the power consumption associated with those use cases when you use 3D and 2D graphics accordingly. Heterogeneous computing is really important. We like to stress that it's really heterogeneous domain computing where we build domains around the heterogeneous architecture and then the power efficiency. Uh, with the FDSOI and the right architecture. So to summarize, really you have a couple of different use cases. You have an MPU and MCU use case, and we all, we all understand the benefits of the MPU use case. The MMU gives you an ability to run rich OSs, and it gives you uh, a neon acceleration support where you can do some uh, vector uh, calculations. And then you have the MCU, uh, concentrating more on the real-time performance, right-sizing the processing, and really achieving low power. So with the 7 ULP, what we do is we bring those two worlds together. We give you an application domain and a real-time domain. We connect performance peripherals to the application domain, and then we connect low power peripherals to the real-time domain. And that really creates this heterogeneous domain computing architecture where we build the domains around the cores, separate buses, separate clocks, separate power domains. And how does that differ from our previous heterogeneous architectures? As you can see, what we're trying to do is maximize the amount of silicon we shut down. So if you see, we've given you the ability to run on the Cortex-M4 and really shut down the application domain. In the past, you were able to only shut down the Cortex-A7 domain. So it's all about maximizing power efficiency, 
maximizing the amount of silicon that you can shut down to properly uh, manage your power consumption. Target application, uh, actually, let me go back here and uh, this might be a good time to really take a poll question in terms of how many people have used the heterogeneous system before. So any type, whether it's a Cortex-A, Cortex-M system, a DSP associated, or maybe a GPU. So we'd like to uh, we'd love to hear back from you in terms of uh, uh, your experience with the heterogeneous systems. All right. So uh, until we get feedback, we'll go on, and then we come yeah, back. Yeah, I'll just jump in there, Nick. Fifty-three percent of respondents said yes. Forty-seven percent said no. Okay, great. So I think that's kind of how we've seen it in the past. We see a lot of uh, uh, people that do have experience with heterogeneous systems and they do see the benefits. And of course, there's that uh, 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 ability to actually maximize the performance of those that have not. So uh, there's a, a key opportunity there to really uh, understand the benefits of the heterogeneous system. <clears throat> so what type of use cases applications uh, would the 7 ULP fit into? Anything battery driven is obvious for uh, uh, power efficiency use cases, but not necessarily portable. You can imagine that the thermostats, many thermostats right now really rely on rich graphics, uh, but yet they also have a battery uh, inside of them. Why? Because a lot of times the 24 volt uh, power line coming to the thermostat can't support everything that's included there, uh, whether it's a larger LCD screen, Wi-Fi, 15.4 communication, a lot of the sensors. So. Uh, and then also you have the IoT applications where you're going to stick some uh, uh, sensor hub application in a portable spot and it's going to really rely on a lot of the power modes, but yet really require you to have uh, rich graphics uh, for better uh, user communication. <clears throat> so a nice little uh, example that I give to people are parking meters. If you, if you see this particular picture, it has a solar panel, so you know it has to be power efficient, but yet it has this poor... Uh, LCD, monochromatic LCD. What we're trying to give you is an ability to uh, have the same type of experience that you have with your cell phone a lot of times. So a lot of people are used to touching things, expanding, pinching. So we want to definitely give that uh, user experience to everyone. Cortex-A9 was uh, the previous score that we used, but now we're moving on to the Cortex-A7 and it's all about power efficiency again. Uh, the performance goes down just quite, just a little bit, but if you see the power efficiency graph there, it almost doubles. So really, power efficiency is the name of the game when choosing the core as well. Here's a quick block diagram. I won't go through it, but I wanted to point out uh, one way that we draw block diagrams for the ultra low power family, and, and that's separating the application domain from the real time domain. We want to make sure that you understand what's on each power domain. So if we, you do decide to shut down the application domain, you still have a clear view of the communication and the security and the timers available to you along with the memory. So as you can see, you have a whole separate system in the real-time domain, uh, mimicking really a microcontroller. Uh, we will have the parts available in consumer industrial grade uh, in 14 by 14 and 10 by 10 uh, packages. Uh, one, require, uh, one does not require any uh, HDI, so the other ones will uh, uh, you can create designs based upon four layers. So, One thing to note is the FDSO, FDSOI technology, a little bit more about that. As you can see on the left side and on the top, you see a, uh, a bulk transistor here, and you see a lot of uh, opportunities for electrons to escape and leak from source to drain. Here in the FDSI, FDSOI section, you see that we've uh, actually added a layer in between uh, to limit the amount of leakage taking place. So that's, uh, so that's one advantage of FDSOI. Another is the ability to body bias, apply a voltage to the backside of the transistor uh, through the tap, as you see there. Uh, you can forward bias, applying a positive voltage, or you can reverse bias, applying a negative voltage. Forward biasing gives you an ability to make the uh, uh, transistor faster. So you can actually increase the transistor speed by about 100 megahertz through forward biasing. Or if you're not really interested in going faster, you can always keep the frequency the same but lower the voltage. Reverse biasing allows you to really shut down the, the, the amount of leakage that you do see 
on the transistor. So if you look at this graph, if you think about it, you can make the transistor faster by forward biasing or slower by reverse body biasing. So when you make it faster, it does uh, uh, it can go faster, but it, the leakage goes up. Uh, but when you don't need to go as fast, you bring it back down uh, in terms of speed, but the leakage goes down uh, quite a bit. So that's that's one advantage there. Graphics, uh, we've chosen the, we've right-sized the graphics. So as you see, we chose the GC7000 Nano Series. It's a single shader uh, uh, configuration. So we're not gonna go after any large screens such as 4K implementations. So we're going after the smaller screens. And that's really key here. It does support OpenGL ES 2.0, OpenVG and the EGL 1.4. So, and also I mentioned that we also do support a 2D GPU uh, to give you a bit blitting capability, uh, as well as the other uh, features that you expect from a 2D graphics engine. So the ability there to do processing on the separate 2D engine is key there, instead of doing all the processing on the 3D engine. And see, you see uh, from the vendor, you see the difference in between the CPC and the 3D, 3D core. The CPC is the composition engine the 2D engine, as you see. So anytime you don't need to use a 3D because you're only doing a 2D uh, configuration, use the 2D engine. I think that's really key here. And that's what we're gonna show today. Uh, so just quickly, we have an EVK available for everybody to use right away. We provide schematics, layout, and BOM so you can easily get started on a SOM implementation. You can quickly throw out the baseboard, create your implementation very easily to match your use case so you can start software development uh, really fast. As I mentioned, it's a four layer design, so clear advantages and cost here. And we do make Linux, Android available on the platform as well as free RTOS running on the Cortex-M4. So thanks again, uh, and I'll give it back to Brian and Alicia. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, so again, my name is Brian Edmond. I am one of the co-founders and the president of Crank Software. So for those of you that don't know, Crank Software was founded in 2007. Uh, we come from an engineering graphics background. So our goal was to provide a better way to create user interfaces for embedded products. Um, and at Crank Software, we're a software and a services company. So that means that we provide embedded UI development software, including development tools and runtime components but we also do full turnkey UI solutions. So we can do professional services to implement the UIs for products um, and deliver them to the cus our customers. So for those of you who may not be familiar with some of uh, the products we're in, here is a list of the brands that uh, trust us to enable, sorry, that trust us to build their user interfaces. I'm sure you recognize some of these. They range from large Fortune 500 companies down to smaller players in the industry, but they all trust Crank Software to implement their UI and help them deliver uh, great products. Now, we talk about product lines and Nick touched on this a little bit in his presentation regarding the ULP and target markets. Um, and you can see a lot of overlap here. So a storyboard can be leveraged in multiple areas. And some of these you may have actually seen or interfaced with in your daily life. Uh, things such automotive appliances, uh, consumer electronics devices. Uh, we talked about thermostats, uh, IOT, smart home, uh, fitness devices, or even kitchen appliances, whether they're ovens or desktop level kitchen appliances that all leverage our user interface solution. Now, a little bit about Storyboard. So Storyboard, as I mentioned, is an embedded UI platform. Now, our goal was to create a better way for you to define your user interfaces and allow you to do faster innovation, innovation uh, preserve your designs among uh, systems, and really give you the performance on the embedded target at the end of the day. Um, we also wanted to scale from low-end MCU up to MPU, and as Nick mentioned, you know, 
the NXP line goes from lower end MCUs all the way up through the 7UL peak into the higher end MPUs. And you can use Storyboard to leverage designs on all of those platforms. Now, to give you a little bit of uh, introduction to Storyboard and the capabilities and how our workflow goes before we get into our use case and our demo, I'll give you the main reason that Storyboard came into being was we had seen a problem in the industry with the serialized development workflow. So what happens is the graphics designers and the UX uh, developers would create a UI. Uh, they would do prototyping on desktop development tools, use things like Photoshop or other sketch or other content to generate it, and then hand off design specs to the engineering team. The engineering and development team would then have to develop BSP software, middleware areas, and also code the UI, let's say in C or C++. What happens there is this long time of that development caused the designers not to be able to see anything on the target until many months down the road at times. Um, many times what they saw may have been compromised, it may not be exactly what they wanted, or the design actually may have changed and before the development was done due to customer feedback or just reskinning. This causes this iteration cycle, as you can see, going back and forth where you're serializing your changes, where they have to be submitted, development is done, and they come out at the end. Now, the result that happened with this is you end up releasing a suboptimal UI. So you don't end up really releasing what you want. You don't release it on time or even on budget. You may have had to add resources to the development project in order to bring the timeline in. Uh, you're losing innovation or even compromising the UI and performance to meet your needs because it took so long for this iteration and these UI changes to come into play. So our solution was to develop Crank Storyboard, which allows you to do a parallelized workflow. What this means is it lets both teams, the design team and this engineering or development team, to work in parallel on the UI. So they can each work in the tools that are custom and in the abilities that they are best suited for. The design team can take their designs, implement them in Photoshop or other development tools, they can import those directly into Storyboard, which we'll see later, um, and really start to refine the UI. They can build animations, their effects, test it right on their desktop, or even push it down to something like a mobile device to get user feedback. All the time refining the UI, while the development team can focus on that lower level software, the board support packages, the middlewares, um, other areas where the UI has to communicate data back and forth to the UI and develop the business logic. And the goal here is that they're paralyzed so at the end they can do an integration phase where the same UI you ran on your desktop, it's not just a prototype that has to be re-implemented, it can be deployed directly down to the target. And what you end up getting is the experience you wanted with the working software on time and on budget and it allows them to totally validate the UI before they even the hardware is possibly available. And what we've seen is by doing this, we can cut down your development time, but also allow you to release with the UI you intended. A couple of other key features that I want to discuss relating to Storyboard is uh, the ability to import directly from Photoshop. So this is very powerful because it allows the graphics team to do their development in a tool such as Photoshop, import it directly into the tool, and then they'll immediately get all their assets, all their layouts, their artboards and elements like that. The other powerful feature here is that if the UI changes or is reskinned based on possible user feedback uh, or testing, they can easily re-import those same UIs in the development tool. Within minutes, they can get a re-imported system and get reskinned. There's no coding or any other development required. Also with our animation timeline, they can add the behavior, um, and really refine the effects to give it that modern UI feel people are expecting right in the tool. Um, compare and merge is a very big these days because many times as development teams are spread across multiple uh, locations or even multiple countries and time zones. And what can happen is as multiple people are developing, you can lose changes and show errors. So having the ability to compare and merge visually uh, is a very powerful tool. And especially in conjunction with testing and validation, where you can actually simulate on your desktop and test and validate your UI before the hardware is ready or it's even there. So in the context of our webinar today with the 7ULP, 
what I'd like to talk about is a use case that we developed based on uh, power testing and some of the target markets for this. Now, one of the use cases we've come up with is a wearable fitness device. So for the wearable fitness device, one of our design requirements would be to have a 3D menuing system. Uh, we want to have the smartphone uh, feel and the really modern UI on the menu when the user's interfacing with it. However, we want to have maybe use a T 2D part, as Nick mentioned, for the lower power drop to do other screens that are up constantly, such as a map that's running or timers or even heart rate monitors or elements like this that you might see. The big challenge here is how do I deliver a rich 3D graphics that is very responsive, but also optimize the power level and the GPU usage based on those demands so that you get the long battery life. And obviously our end goal is to give you an exceptional user experience, but give you the long battery life and the low power draw. Before I switch over to Storyboard and show you this, we're going to have a poll question here related to, are you currently engaged in a project requiring 3D and 2D platforms? Like 70% of people say yes. They are currently engaged in a project looking at 3D and 2D graphics. Great. So one thing we're talking about today a lot is we're going to be talking about the use of 3D and 2D graphics at the same time in the platform. Because many other times what you'd see is you either go down the path of a pure UI rendering 3D or a pure UI rendering 2D. And that's when later we're going to touch on the concept of hybrid rendering, which is to bring these two worlds together. So what I'd like to do now is switch over directly to Storyboard to show you the use case that we're talking about that we have run on the 7 ULP. So here you can see Storyboard, which is a development tool. And within Storyboard, you can see we have our application here that we developed. Um, you can see that all the screens are visible to you in a more of a drag and drop style um, selection. And you can really look at the experience and refine it from the tool. Now, we can also go in and simulate our application and show you the application that we're speaking about. So here what you see is we've actually leveraged 3D by implementing a 3D model as a menuing system. So this gives people the rich animated UI that they're looking for and the modern feel of a 3D part. However, once you click on a particular menu, you can come to a screen. It still has lots of animations and a rich UI. However, you could leverage the 2D acceleration and gain a power savings by using this on this part of the interface. The developer can merely build this, interface with the 3D object, then when they go down to other screens, let's say a mapping screen, you can see the effects and the animation for a screen that may come up for a long period of time. Uh, but you, still, you want the long battery life. You don't want to use the GPU constantly for this part. So the other thing, as we're discussing the differences between 3D and 2D in the context of the UI, and when we show later the power draw associated, we want the ability to actually compare a pure 2D implementation also. So what we've done is we've built a 2D version of this application. So we've taken the same application, we've just changed the launcher from a 3D model to a 2D menuing system. So you can see here, if I click on some of the same screens, once you click on these elements, we have the same content afterwards. It's only the menuing system that changed. We have the same animation, same screens. So it's largely the same application. We just have changed this. And what that's going to allow us to do is to compare 3D versus 2D and later versus our concept of a hybrid 2D and 3D rendering model. Now, something else I can show you within Storyboard that we touched upon earlier was the ability to generate uh, animations directly from the tool, which is very powerful for the graphics designer to be able to customize the interface. So if I was to select one of these animations, you can see we have a timeline here. And the timeline really allows you to look at every step of your animation. You can modify timing curves and all of this scenarios that they want to see. You can also simulate this so that you have the ability to test this and see is this the animation effect I want and you could really tweak it 
to really get the desired interface. Now, something I could show you quickly here is the way we create these animations also is very easy and can be done very quickly. So if we were to look at our 2D menuing system, here when we select on an item, we merely change to the next screen. But if you wanted to refine this interface and give more feedback to the user, what we're going to do is we're going to add an animation. So within Storyboard, we have the ability to record an animation. So if I select the record button, it puts Storyboard in a mode where we're going to record all of the things that the, you are doing in order to build up that animation timeline. So in my case, I'm going to make all of these items fall down from the screen in a stacking order uh, before we actually change. So for example, I can select the dashboard and just merely move it down the bottom of the screen. Once that is off, then I can select the keyframe. So if I wanted to do these one at a time, I can then say, okay, that's one frame. Then I will go down and move the GPS down. Again, we're going to keyframe that and set that as a step. And I'm gonna carry on with the nutrition and the cardio screens or selection buttons, sorry. And lastly, my cardio. So once we have that complete, I can then save my animation and give it a name. We'll call it menu slide. You can also give it a target frame rate that you want for your application of this particular animation. And we're going to save that. So what's going to happen is Storyboard will restore all of your buttons to their correct locations before you made the changes. And it's going to populate this animation timeline where you can see each step along the way and how they're stacked with my frames. Now, in order to test and visualize what we've just done, we can select the preview. And then you can see these go down. Now, what you can see here is they fall one at a time. So if I decided I would rather they more of a stacking order and are contiguous, I can then really just edit the timeline. Drag them across. Then again, I can preview. See, do I like this one better? And once I'm happy with that, the other change I could make, I could decide it seems a little slow. So maybe I'll scale it and I'll make it about 25% faster. Again, we'll test that. And now that I'm happy with my interface, all I need to do is cause it to happen and create an action in Storyboard. So if we look at our cardio example, uh, we have an action here that says, when I press on this, it's going to switch to the uh, cardio screen. So I can then add a new action, and all an action is is an event, so a press event on the button, and what does it cause to happen? So that's going to cause an animation, and then I can select my menu slide animation. So that when I press, it's going to cause the menu to slide. Now, I don't want to switch to my screen right away. I want to wait till the animation is complete. So whenever you create an animation, something that Storyboard does is it automatically creates an event for you that lets you know when the animation is done. So what we can do is just find this animate complete menu slide here, and we can say when that animation is done, now switch to this cardio screen. So all we have to do now is save it. Then if we simulate, you can see I have my same screen. When I select cardio, it runs my animation and switch back to the screen. So that's how quickly and easily you can create your animations and your effects to allow the graphic designer not have to really develop any C, C++ code in order to start generating these systems. So I'm gonna switch back now to our presentation and let's talk a little bit about uh, how we did this and what it means to the 7UOP and the power levels. So as we discussed, Storyboard is a scalable solution 
Uh, so we can go from lower end, you'll see multiple operating systems here, but you can also go from a software render up to a 2D render such as G2D, which is available on the platform, all the way up to a 3D GPU. Um, the same UI can be leveraged across all three of these platforms uh, with one change as we made in the UI as just change the, the launcher menu from a model. And that way we can actually compare these three options on the system. So what does that mean in conjunction with our power testing and our 7ULP example? Is we want to render the same UI with different graphics pipelines. So this means we're going to take the UI and run it on the platform using OpenGL ES to render all of the screen content, whether it's 2D or 3D. We can then take the UI and leverage the 2D accelerator or G2D to render that content with the minor change of this menu on the screen. And lastly, we're going to introduce this hybrid model where we're going to leverage OpenGL ES and G2D at the same time to give you really the best of both worlds of performance and power levels. Now, you'll see here we, we have this storyboard uh, hybrid rendering slide. And what we have here is a comparison of the options we're discussing. So as I said, OpenGL ES that is really the standard way that most UI toolkits would render. You would take your system and program it and put it down on the target and it would be an all or nothing affair where it would render the entire content with OpenGL ES. You'd be using the higher power draw, you'd receive a shorter battery life, but you get that high end user experience, but you're paying a price for that with the power draw and the battery life. Then you have the option to use G2D, which is the 2D accelerator which as we've seen from Nick's slides and discussion, um, we're gonna use the lower power draw. So it's used less power, you get longer battery life, um, but we'll call your user interface standard. You're still seeing the effects and the UI and the animations, but you're not getting that higher end UI that people are expecting these days with the introduction of 3D content. The third option that we're calling hybrid rendering, it's the ability to have both. So you can render 3D content and 2D content and have the system being storyboard determine which GPU to use and dynamically switch on the fly. Uh, this gives you, we'll call it a medium power draw and you'll see the numbers in a moment, uh, which is closer to G2D's power draw. You get that longer battery life, but you still get that high end user experience. When the user is interacting with the device, they can have that high end menu. When you switch to the other screens, they can go down into a lower power mode. Now, you'll see on the side that we're comparing to other UI software. So Storyboard being a scalable solution, we support all of these rendering options uh, on the fly, whereas most other user interface software will only support a single one, which is generally OpenGL ES, and they largely don't take advantage of some proprietary systems such as the G2T side. So I'm gonna let Nick talk for a moment about the power numbers as we're discussing the seven ULP comparisons and discuss how they develop these numbers and what they've seen with the comparison. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I think it's one thing uh, uh, is important to point out that uh, low power isn't the whole story when you're comparing 3D and 2D. A lot of times 2D GPUs are better performing at 2D functions rather than performing those 2D functions on a 3D GPU. So not only do you get lower power using the 2D GPU, but also you get better performance out of it. So as you can see, the hybrid model is really what we're, tr we're trying to uh, enable with the 7 ULP for the use cases that really demand uh, low power. So it really lets you go back and forth between 2D engine and the 3D engine. And a lot of uh, solutions don't let you do that. So really the, the Crank Storyboard is, is, is really successful in doing that. And as you can see, uh, we took the a demonstration that uh, Brian showed that has been running on the 7 ULP for quite some time and we said let's measure the power just kind of show you what it's uh, what it's doing and as you can see the first option is the 3D only uh, scenario where you're seeing almost uh, 90 uh, microamps uh, here uh, I'm sorry milliamps here and this is really measuring the domain where both the Cortex A7 and the GPUs reside so this is where the all the power consumption is going to come from. So uh, 89 uh, milliamps coming out of the 3D option. And then you, when you have everything locked down to 2D, you're going to see a drop in power definitely, uh, but you're going to lack the 3D animation that everybody expects, as Brian mentioned. 
best case scenario is you're only going up a little bit in terms of power consumption from the 2D option, but now you're giving the opportunity to really uh, leverage the 3D GPU for the best case uh, rich graphics uh, that really everybody wants in, in low power applications as well. So. Uh, so here is, uh, is really proof that uh, not only you get better performance, but you also get lower power with the combination of the Crank Storyboard uh, and the iDynamic 7 ULP. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, just to touch on this for a minute, a great point that Nick uh, brought up was the fact that 2D uh, graphics are generally better and you can get better performance when accelerated with 2D parts. OpenGL ES is very good at accelerating 3D content, but sometimes you actually will get better user interface performance, better animation and effects using 2D when 2D is really all that's required. So, go ahead. Yeah, and another thing to note is that uh, really, uh, both those options, all those options are definitely better than a software rendering, right? So uh, really you get the bad performance and really bad uh, power consumption when you have to do everything on, on, on the core, so. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so a little bit on how this uh, hybrid rendering solution actually works. So the idea is that you would build your interface with Storyboard leveraging 2D and 3D content. So the graphics designer or the developer can just go in and build it, add 3D where they want 3D, add 2D where they want 3D. What Storyboard is going to do is actually parse that and determine which GPU is best to perform the function. And then it's going to dynamically switch between each one of these um, to in a single user interface. So if I go back to Storyboard for a moment, what we can see here is when we run this on the target system, actually, let me go back here and show you. We have here, this is a 3D model that you can see on the side. And the 3D model, sorry, the 3D model was implemented and imported directly from a, a 3D design tool. Uh, we can also import the animations and effects from this model and actually let them customize the look and feel of that. But then the other screens that were implemented were largely implemented, let's say, with images, text, shapes, and paths and the like that don't necessarily need the 3D content there. So when we simulate this on our desktop, you will see when we have the 3D model, storyboard engine running on the 7 ULP will determine that's 3D content, I need to leverage the 3D GPU. It will enable the 3D GPU, give you the interface and the feedback you're looking for. Then once we select a different screen, which is built mainly of 2D content, storyboard can automatically switch between that and G2D, disable the 3D processor, switch to G2D, thus giving you the lower power draw, but still the animation, the effects, and the performance your users are looking for. So when the user's interacting with it, we don't mind maybe a little bit of higher power draw to give them this look and feel. Then in the long running screen, such as navigation or heart rate and such, they can actually see the lower power gains and the animation effects. And the designer, didn't really have to do much other than determine where does it make sense for me to add 3D content and where does it make sense for me to have lower power in 2D content. So as a recap of that, um, we've seen that when you add in Storyboard the OpenGL model, um, we can leverage the OpenGL ES or higher power GPU versus the other screens, which are mainly 2D content, where we can leverage something like G2D give you a lower power mode, but still give you the high performance that users are expecting. Now will switch it back to Alicia. Okay, well, thanks, thanks, thanks so much, Nick and Brian for that. We've got a couple of questions that have come in and I just encourage anybody that um, I've been thinking about something that would like to ask, if just haven't submitted it through the Q&A box on the right hand side, just to pop it through. Um, so the first question we have, Brian, is actually from you today. Uh, it is, are there any code changes required to switch from G2D and OpenGL rendering? Um, from the developer or user of Storyboard's perspective, there are no code changes. We have taken that into account in our rendering engine technology. So as you saw when I, I was uh, building the animation, for example, within the development tool, I didn't actually have to write any code. I'm 
using the tool and the powerful timeline, you can build out those effects. And the same thing can be done when you import your 3D model or add 2D content. You're not actually generating any C and C++ code there. You don't have to write that. The underlying storyboard engine has been developed to understand that there are two GPUs in the part and be able to leverage each one of those. Um, in the examples we did for the power test, actually, what we did is we took the same UI and we put three different rendering engines on the target and ran them to run the uh, ran them through a scenario to develop the power numbers for each test. And that was done with really no code changes uh, from a C and C++ or anything like that perspective to generate those numbers. I have a question for Nick. Nick, you say heterogeneous architecture on this 7ULP different than other IMX processes? Oh, Nick, you are not. You're on yes, mute. Sorry about that. Yes, uh, as I tried to uh, mention before, really we're moving from a heterogeneous architecture to a heterogeneous domain computing kind of architecture where we try to separate the systems. Previously, we put both cores and, and the GPU on exactly the same power domain. And that doesn't allow you to really shut down any silicon to get lower power when you're uh, when you don't use those uh, uh, domains. So really we're going towards the direction of giving you the ability to really be flexible in what you power up, what you run, and how you shut them down, and how uh, really you go into low power modes. So uh, the heterogeneous idea is the same, but really the low power advantage is there on the 7 ELP versus the, the, the past uh, designs. Question for, for the two of you. Yeah, I mean, from our side, we're seeing the low power modes, and I think Nick mentioned this, in everything from wearable medical devices and areas like that to uh, even, even the thermostat side. So the ability to dynamically switch between two GPUs and actually leverage a power savings can be used across a lot of devices that you're seeing in the industry these days. And, and many of the parts are coming out with actually OpenGL, and as also was mentioned, you can get better performance by actually doing the switch at the right area, right points in time in your UI. I'm going to repeat this question. Sorry, Nick. I don't think I'm standing close enough to the uh, to the microphone. My question was: We talked about the possibility here for uh, this hybrid rendering of 7 ULP for consumer devices. Just wondering, from the NXP standpoint, where do you see, um, or industry-wise? Where do you see uh, the greatest opportunity for this type of technology in the future? Well, I think that uh, consumer uh, is kind of a no-brainer, but I think that you're going to see the need for uh, richer graphics in all aspects, uh, industrial, uh, obviously automotive as well. Uh, but um, the, the need to mimic the type of graphics capability that we see every day on our cell phones, I think that's really the most important thing that uh, we're driving at. Uh, Unfortunately, the cell phones do have uh, really extended capabilities, so they're really higher power. Uh, they consume a lot of power, hence their batteries are really quite large. What we're trying to get to, as you can see from some of the use cases that we're showing, uh, risk-based uh, uh, medical wearables really is, is where you're going to see the, the most effect, giving you rich graphics, a, a lower power, and extended battery life. So uh, I feel like the opportunity there is to uh, extend battery lives in all situations, uh, not only consumer, but also industrial, as well as I mentioned on the parking meter example. Oh, okay. okay. So, Nick, is, there, is the 7 ULP in production today? Yes, correct. We just launched the Identimax 7 ULP uh, just last month, so it's in full production. Uh, it's stocked in all the distributors, as well as uh, nxp.com. So, uh, definitely find, uh, you can definitely find more information on 7ULP.com. I'm sorry, uh, nxp.com. <laughs> yeah, there's actually, I'll post it in the chat box there, but there's um, there's two links there. So um, uh, just Brian, from our, uh, from our standpoint, from storyboard standpoint, um, who has uh, access to hybrid memory? And is it in production? 
Um, so right now, when you download your free trial from our website, you will receive all the existing render managers. Um, as far as the hybrid rendering version, uh, that would be a contact through our support. Um, it's currently available on the 7ULP. We actually have a demo image on our website, and you can download this demo image from the website and once you have your ULP, and you can boot the board into this exact demo that we've run running this rendering model. And those URLs are actually there on everybody's screen. So um, there's both the free trial of Storyboard and the demo images for the 7ULP. Um, if you visit our NXP page there um, under our resources section. Uh, you can also go to nxp.com and if you search user search function for our IMX 7ULP, you will find very quickly that evaluation kit on, on, online there that you can purchase. Um, so on that note, we're going to give you 10 minutes back for your morning. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have thank you. Day. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.